This is Barkor Street in Lhasa. One of the best known places in Tibet, it's also one of the most crowded. 76-year-old Ma Ningxuan grew up on Barkor Street. It's changed a lot over the years. But the old house where his family lived until half a century ago is still standing. Whenever he's in the area, Ma always makes a point of stopping by. The Doichin, or householder class, were the middle of three classes of serfs under Old Tibet's feudal system. They owned no land and mostly earned a living by carrying out short-term labor contracts or producing handicrafts. If no work was available, they might be forced to resort to begging. Ma Ningxuan's family were allowed to eke out a living from their small mill on Barko Street, on the condition that they performed regular korvi, or unpaid labor, for the Lhasa government. Ma Ningxuan will never forget the summer of 1959. For the first time in his life, he stood on Barko Street, no longer a serf. <laughs> Nineteen fifty nine was a turning point in Tibet's history. That year, in a desperate bid to preserve the system of serf ownership, reactionary forces in the upper ruling strata staged an armed rebellion. It was soon put down, and the Central People's Government in Beijing issued a decree dissolving the local government of Tibet and enforcing democratic reforms. Thus, the centuries-old system of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule came to an end, and a brand new social system was established. It was a day that reformers both inside and outside Tibet had been striving for. The photographs were taken in 1904 by Captain William Heyman. He was a member of the 3,000-strong British military expedition that invaded Tibet in October 1903 via India. The crisis the action provoked transformed Tibet's relationship with the outside world. Less than 100 meters from Ma Ningxuan's old house, on the north side of Barko Street, is a courtyard residence. This was once the offices of the High Commissioner of the Qing Dynasty. High Commissioners were first appointed to Tibet in 1727 to oversee the local administration. In the course of the nearly 300 years that followed, the Qing Dynasty sent a total of 136 High Commissioners to the region. Two years after the 1903 British invasion, Zhang Yintang arrived in Tibet. As High Commissioner, he would attempt to resolve the crisis the invasion had caused. People in great misery and dead bodies everywhere. Civilians mostly unemployed, and nearly all homes are empty. What Zhang Yintang witnessed was a society corrupted by the system of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule. Zhang Yintang initiated a series of reforms. He proposed abolishing theocratic rule, punishing corrupt officials, and reviving agriculture, industry, and commerce. To improve the living conditions of the serfs, Zhang demanded that the estate owners reduce the taxes imposed upon them. He also promoted education, the reclamation of wasteland, and the development of production. In essence, Zhang Yintang was continuing the reform movement of the late Qing dynasty. In Tibet, however, 
he met with considerable resistance. Politically, Zhang Yintang suggested abolishing the Dalai Lama's secular powers. In a move that would strike at the roots of Tibet's theocratic system, he called for the Dalai and Panchen Lamas to attend solely to religious affairs. Following Zhang Yintang's departure from Tibet after just eight months in office, the Qing dynasty continued the reforms he had initiated. In 1909, Zhao Arfeng was sent as High Commissioner to Tibet. Accompanied by 2,000 elite troops from Sichuan, he was charged with enforcing the government's new policies. Among the soldiers was Ma Ningxuan's grandfather. Two years later, as a result of the 1911 revolution, the Qing dynasty collapsed and was replaced by the Republic of China. The curtain was brought down on two millennia of feudal monarchy in China. In Tibet, the reforms and new policies were consequently withdrawn, as were the troops stationed there. But Ma Ningxuan's grandfather remained and started a small business in Lhasa. He began to pay tax to the Kashag, or new governing council in Tibet. From a Qing dynasty soldier, he thus became a serf. This is a variety of Coreopsis, known locally as the His Excellency Zhang flower. It's widely planted in Tibet today, and it was first introduced there by Zhang Yintang. Zhang was highly regarded among ordinary Tibetans for his efforts to improve the living standards of the poverty-stricken serfs. However, the weakness of the collapsing Qing dynasty he served prevented him from reforming Tibet's system of serfdom. Chang'o Pa Tseang is a professor at Tibet University and an expert on Tibetan history. In the 1980s, when researching the 13th Dalai Lama and his reform policies, she came across several references to her grandfather. In 1913, Changopa Rinzin Dorje was sent to study in England. At the time, the 13th Dalai Lama was attempting to implement a series of reforms, which he termed new policies. However, his chief concern was strengthening his personal rule, which, he hoped, might be reinforced with the support of an overseas educated elite. In 1924, Changopa Rinzin Dorje was assigned by the Dalai Lama to build a hydropower station in the northern suburbs of Lhasa. However, the project was fiercely opposed by Tibet's conservative upper class. Key to the Dalai Lama's new policies were several desperately needed infrastructure projects involving water conservancy, hydropower, telecommunications and land survey. Also covered was government reform. However, to the serf owners, it seemed that their interests were under threat and that the entire system of theocratic rule would ultimately be undermined. Their opposition was an obstacle not even the Dalai Lama could overcome, and so his new policies were doomed to failure. 
could not change the social system because he was the center of this social system. So she, he should he should uh, act against himself. So he, of course he didn't do that. Uh, he only wanted to to uh, guarantee his own power. This is Dwardi Hydropower Station, which conservatives once opposed being built. In the event, the station generated power solely for the Dalai Lama and a few other members of the upper class elite. Tibet's first ever hydropower station made no difference to the lives of ordinary people who still relied on oil lamps. Chanlo Chen Wanchu Nam Gye is now enjoying his retirement in the old courtyard house left to him by his grandfather. Chanlo Chen is one of the most eminent noble family names in the history of Tibet. Their ancestor, Miwang Polanai, a duke during the reign of Chinese Emperor Qianlong in the 18th century, ruled Tibet for 20 years. In the first half of the 20th century, Wan Chu Namgye's grandfather, Chanlo Chen Sonam Gyalpo, played a prominent role in Tibet's early social reform movement. Sonam Gyalpo had inherited his family titles at the age of 19. At 25, he was sent to Gyangzi, where he studied at a British military academy. His experiences there led him to reconsider his attitude towards the prevailing political system in Tibet. Back in Lhasa, Chan Lo Chen Sonam Gyalpo joined the reform movement launched by other Tibetan army officers. In the wake of the movement's eventual failure, he would be stripped of his hereditary titles. At a 1934 meeting, Sonam Gyalpo gave a memorable speech. <laughs> Lempiting his speech was brutally attacked by conservative forces. Having come close to changing the history of Tibet, the reforms he supported ultimately failed, bringing severe consequences for him. Earlier, in the spring of 1934, Chano Chen Sonam Gyalpo had been asked by a secret society to write a petition that would be submitted to the Kashan. The petition demanded a four-year term instead of lifelong tenure for the Kalans, or members of the Kasha, who would also be elected. The plan was to submit the petition to the Kasha on the morning of May the 10th, 1934. The founder of the secret society was Lungshar Dorje Shege, once a favorite of the 13th Dalai Lama. Back in 1913, 
he'd been responsible for taking a group of four Tibetan aristocratic youngsters to study in England. However, Lungsha was betrayed by an informer and thrown into this prison, immediately below the Patala Palace. He was sentenced to having his eyes gouged out and his property confiscated. As a central figure among the reformers, Sonam Gyalpo also faced punishment. Pai Chanlo Chen Sonam Gyalpo fled to India. In 1935, with the support of the Kuomintang government in China, he and several colleagues founded the Tibet Improvement Party. These are the application forms and membership cards of the Tibet Improvement Party. In 1946, the party's activities were uncovered by the Indian police. Consequently, the British authorities raided their headquarters. Leading party members were forced to flee India. Others were arrested and imprisoned. As a result of the raid, the party's full agenda was revealed. More than just the reform of the ruling system in Tibet, it sought the liberation of Tibet from the existing tyrannical government and the revolutionary restructuring of Tibet's government and society. In 1947, at the age of 50, Chanlo Chen Sonam Gyalpo returned to Lhasa. Having spent his life trying to break Tibet's closed, corrupt and unfair system of feudal serfdom, he was resolved to lead a quiet life in Lhasa, awaiting his next opportunity. At the time of Sonam Gyalpo's return to Lhasa, tremendous change was sweeping the rest of China. On May the 23rd, 1951, the agreement between the Central People's Government and the local government of Tibet on measures for the peaceful liberation of Tibet, known as the 17 Article Agreement, was signed. With Tibet's peaceful liberation, the foreign imperialist forces were driven out and their attempts to create an independent Tibet brought to a halt. The great unity of the Chinese nation was also finally achieved. By dispelling the stagnation in Tibetan society, solid foundations could be laid for democratic reforms and social development. From September the 26th to the 29th in 1951, a conference of religious and secular officials and representatives of the three most prominent monasteries was held to debate the agreement. The conference report to the Dalai Lama stated, The 17 article agreement that has been signed is of great and unrivaled benefit to the grand cause of the Dalai and to Buddhism, politics, the economy and other aspects of life in Tibet. Naturally, it should be implemented. On October the 24th, 1951, the Dalai Lama sent a telegram to Chairman Mao Zedong in which he wrote, 
On the basis of friendship, delegates from the two sides signed on May 23, 1951, the Agreement on Measures for the Peaceful Liberation of Tibet. The local government in Tibet, as well as religious and secular people, unanimously support this agreement and under the leadership of Chairman Mao and the Central People's Government will actively assist the PLA troops entering Tibet to consolidate national defense, expel any imperialist influences from Tibet and safeguard the unity of the territory and the sovereignty of the motherland. That autumn, PLA forces entered Lhasa. Among them, a 20-year-old soldier named Wang Gui, a member of the PLA's 18th Army. The PLA soldiers soon realized that the reaction to their arrival was mixed. It took Wang Gui and his comrades less than a month to solve the food problem. They did so by farming land along the Lhasa River. By the following year, the 18th Army had established two large farms and was growing all the food it needed for itself. But in Tibet's unique natural and social environment, the PLA soldiers would face many more challenges other than obtaining food, which they would have to overcome if they were to remain there for the long term. One problem was propaganda demonizing the Communist Party. But the PLA soldiers were determined to work hard and make a good impression. The rumors soon died away. With its peaceful liberation and the PLA's arrival, Tibet was introduced to much that was new and modern. The enduring stagnation in Tibetan society was being eroded. In 1956, the Central Institute for Nationalities in Beijing began recruiting students from Tibet. 14-year-old Ma Ningxuan signed up after receiving reassurances that no questions would be asked about his family background and social status. Following peaceful liberation, the PLA and government personnel sent to Tibet acted resolutely to implement the 17 article agreement. Various steps were taken to help the farmers and herdsmen develop production. Measures were adopted to offer social assistance, disaster relief support and disease prevention and treatment free of charge. In 1950, work began on Tibet's first major road projects. Four years later, the Qinghai Tibet and Cham Tibet highways were open to traffic. 
telephones, telegraphs, banks, newspapers and radio began to appear. Meanwhile, the central government was taking steps to end the practice of Corvi labour and to outlaw local officials' right to levy taxes and exercise legal authority. So we are doing so good things. So the lower class is going to be slow. So this is the Xin Han people. The Pusa people. This is the name of the people. In The Making of Modern Tibet, Canadian Tibetologist A. Tom Grunfeld wrote, Ordinary Tibetans liked the Han because they were honest and they distributed land. Among the younger generation of the nobility, it was seen as an opportunity to make some positive changes. The photographs were taken in 1952 and they show Chan Lo Chen Sonam Gyalpo and other progressive members of the upper class who, like him, saw hope in change, discussing how they could assist the PLA in Tibet. They took steps to furnish the soldiers with food, firewood and other provisions. Sonam Gyalpo also gave Tibetan language lessons to members of the garrison and helped found Lhasa Primary School. However, it would still be some time before the systematic reform he was anticipating could be introduced. Tibet, covering an area of over one million square kilometers and with a population of more than one million, was the last society of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule in human history. The abolition movement had started gathering momentum elsewhere in the world centuries previously. In 1784, France became the first country to outlaw slavery. In 1833, Britain passed a law banning the sale of African slaves. Russia introduced the emancipation of its serfs in 1861, after a struggle lasting nearly a century. The United States fought a civil war over the issue of slavery. In 1865, following the North's victory, President Lincoln outlawed the ownership of slaves. Social reform was at the heart of the 17 Article Agreement. Article 11 states, In matters related to various reforms in Tibet, there will be no compulsion on the part of the central authorities. The local government of Tibet should carry out reforms of its own accord, and when the people raise demands for reform, they shall be settled by means of consultation with the leading personnel of Tibet. Why did the central government, having carried out the peaceful liberation, not immediately set about implementing democratic reform to abolish the system of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule. Chairman Mao Zedong himself explained the reason. Because the conditions are not ripe for Tibet to carry out democratic reform. In accordance with the 17 article agreement between the central and local governments, reform of the social system must be implemented. But as to when to do so, the decision should be made when the majority of people and leaders in Tibet feel the time is right. There is no need for haste. Peaceful liberation was prompting mounting calls for reform among the majority of Tibetan people. Even many of the more enlightened members of the upper class realized that reform of the old system was inevitable if there was ever to be prosperity. The in fact, the Central People's Government did everything possible to accommodate Tibet's upper ruling class. However, the 14th Dalai Lama and some members of the Tibetan ruling class, while on the surface supporting the 17 Article Agreement and heralding Tibet's new dawn, were seeking solely to maintain their vested interests and privileges as the serf owner class. They remained fundamentally opposed to reform and committed to a no-change policy in an attempt to perpetuate the system of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule. 
In 1954, the Dalai Lama traveled to Beijing to attend the first National People's Congress, where he was elected vice chairman of its standing committee. In a speech to the Congress, he fully affirmed the success in implementing the 17 article agreement during the previous three years and expressed enthusiastic support for the principle of regional autonomy for ethnic groups. On October the 1st, the Dalai Lama was among the party and state leaders reviewing the parade to celebrate China's National Day. From Beijing, he embarked on a tour of coastal and northeastern cities. Back in Beijing, on February the 23rd, 1955, to mark Tibetan New Year, the Dalai Lama met Chairman Mao Zedong again. He stated, We can assure Chairman Mao that under your leadership and that of the Chinese Communist Party, we will work for the good of Tibet. Only three months later, the Dalai Lama gave tacit approval to a plan put to him by his religious advisor Chi Gyang, aimed at overthrowing the democratic reform. He also accepted the so-called petition from Gyali Chodzi and others, calling for the restoration of outlawed institutions and the permanent maintenance of the system of feudal serfdom. On April the 22nd, 1956, the Dalai Lama was appointed chairman of the Preparatory Committee of Tibet Autonomous Region. At the meeting to establish the committee, he reaffirmed that the 17 article agreement had allowed the people of Tibet to, as he put it, fully enjoy all rights of national ethnic equality and embark on a bright road of freedom and happiness. By the 1950s in Tibet, Despite the absence of any major reforms, progress had become an irresistible force. The serfs were raising their voices in support of change, and in 1956, 65 of them wrote to the Dalai Lama demanding immediate democratic reform. Subsequently, the calls for an end to the system of feudal serfdom grew louder. Large demonstrations were held, demanding its immediate abolition and the introduction of democratic reforms. Tamanjeola, 四川土改的消息啊,有些人就跑到四川省委找李景全他们就要求了呀,我们要分地! At the core of the democratic reforms was the right of the serfs to be masters of their own affairs, but this posed a direct threat to the fundamental interests of Tibet's serf-owning upper class. The very foundations of the feudal society were about to be shaken. 农奴主,中间有一部分了,他们不愿意把自己占有的这个土地 the founding of the Preparatory Committee of Tibet Autonomous Region and the cries for democratic reforms raised by serfs there and in the neighboring provinces caused panic among Tibet's ruling class. In a desperate bid to avert change, a group of reactionaries plotted an armed rebellion aimed at splitting Tibet from the motherland. They formed insurgent groups and put up slogans calling for Tibetan independence and condemning the reform. They also attacked local agencies and army personnel sent by the central government to Tibet, looted shops, killed officials, maimed civilians and raped women. The Central People's Government issued repeated pleas to the local government of Tibet to act to maintain social order and punish the rebels. The reactionaries, though, misjudged the situation and interpreted the central government's patience as a sign of weakness. On March 10, 1959, with the support of foreign anti-China elements, they instigated an all-out armed rebellion in Lhasa. Insurgents shouting, Independence for Tibet and Han people out of Tibet vandalized the city. They convened a series of so-called People's Conferences and a People's Congress of the Independent State of Tibet. Through their actions, they effectively tore up the 17 Article Agreement. During the night of March the 17th, 
the Dalai Lama and the rebel leaders fled Lhasa for Shannan, the base of the rebel armed forces. Back in Lhasa, following the Dalai Lama's flight, in the early hours of March the 20th, the 7,000 strong insurgent force launched an all-out attack on party, government and military institutions in the city. With the rebellion's defeat, the Dalai Lama fled to India. The central government, in order to safeguard the nation's unity and the fundamental interests of the people of Tibet, was resolved to put down the insurgency. With the support of the Tibetan people, the People's Liberation Army units in Tibet launched a counteroffensive against the rebels in Lhasa, and by March the 21st, the rebellion had been completely put down and life in Lhasa began returning to normal. In response to what was an act of treason by the reactionaries, on March the 28th, 1959, Premier Zhou Enlai issued a state council order dissolving the local government of Tibet, with its functions and powers to be assumed by the Preparatory Committee of Tibet Autonomous Region. Within three months, the committee had proposed a series of democratic reforms. These included abolishing the system of exploitation and changing the system of feudal ownership into one of ownership by farmers and herdsmen. From a place serving the feudal serf owners, Tibet was being transformed into a place for the Tibetan people themselves. Thus, under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, a magnificent movement for democratic reform was launched by the Tibetan people, which brought about the most extensive most profound and greatest social change in the region's history. After hundreds of years, Tibet's system of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule was completely abolished. It was an inevitable requirement of social progress for democratic reforms to be enforced and the feudal system to be abolished. If Tibetan society was to develop, and the most pressing desire of the Tibetan people was to be met, there could be no other way. I think it's very positive. A combination of living in poverty or facing a development into the modern world, one assumes most sensible, rational people would prefer to live in the modern world. A million serfs in Tibet were liberated. Their life, security and freedom were guaranteed by the constitution and laws of the People's Republic of China. They were no longer suffering under the political oppression of the estate owners, forced to perform corvi labor and subjected to inhumane treatment. Heavy taxation and usurious exploitation were also a thing of the past. <laughs> The land of those surf owners who had participated in the 1959 rebellion was confiscated and handed over to the serfs, while those who had not taken part received compensation.
After the abolition of the system of feudal serfdom, the liberated people of all ethnic groups in Tibet set about building a popular democracy. By the end of 1960, the region had 1,009 village level and 283 district level governments, 78 counties and eight special areas or cities. In 1961, a general election was held across Tibet. For the first time ever, the former serfs and slaves could exercise their rights as the masters of the country and elect representatives to govern them. In September 1965, the Tibet Autonomous Region People's Congress held its first session and Tibet Autonomous Region was officially established. Through the democratic reforms, the policy was implemented of political unity, religious freedom, and separation of state and religion. The monasteries were stripped of their feudal privileges in economic and political affairs. They lost the power to enforce feudal exploitation and their internal systems of feudal management and hierarchy were abolished. And so, the final manifestation of feudal serfdom was wiped from human history and Tibet became a democratic, socialist society. The people of all ethnic groups in Tibet were now the true masters of the state and society. Tibet's vu être un réel bouleversement, et c'est extrêmement important d'un point de vue effectivement de l'histoire du droit et je dirais de l'histoire effectivement générale des de droits de l'homme et surtout euh, de l'histoire par rapport à la Chine. En faisant ça, la Chine a aussi montré son importance dans l'histoire de l'humanité. I think that um, the future of Tibet will be bright and uh, Tibetans will live uh, better and better. Chen Sonam Gyalpo died in 1972. Since 1959, in accordance with his wishes, the family have all done full-time jobs and made a contribution in many walks of life. Dechen Droma, who was born in a barn, still lives in Kelsong village. These days, her most important duty is to take her four-year-old granddaughter to kindergarten every day. Here in the village, all school-aged children are entitled to free education. Dabsang and his family now farm 43 mu, nearly three hectares. He's grateful for the life he enjoys today. Now in her 90s, Tering Hamo is living with her daughter. Her name means Longevity Angel Lady. The old lady believes that her name only rings true in the new Tibet. After the 1959 rebellion was put down, Ma Ningxuan returned to Lhasa, where he became a journalist. Before his retirement, he was the Xinhua News Agency's bureau chief in Tibet. These days, he and his wife 
often spend their leisure time walking by the Lhasa River. The river is called Kyu Chu in Tibetan, meaning river of happiness.